We open, Lord, the inner depth of our being, our very life. And we acknowledge, Lord, that you've spoken to us this day. You've called us. You've beckoned us. You've asked that we come into your presence. Yes. Oh, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We lift up our hearts for truly, Lord, we come. We greatly desire to enter into your presence. We greatly desire, Lord, that we might know you. That we might truly, Lord, experientially enter into your courts with praise, thanksgiving, and the quickening power of your presence moving upon us. We love it, Lord. We desire it greatly. We open our hearts and our spirits and we would say, Welcome, Lord. Come. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Quicken us. Open the heavens. Move on us. Stir us, Lord. Lift us, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Lift us, Lord. And Lord, in the inner depth of our being, we thank you, Lord, for your presence this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can indeed meet with you. And you, Lord, you're meeting with us. And Lord, we're greatly blessed as we worship you, knowing, Lord, that you're pleased with that worship and that you're receiving it and responding to it. And we thank you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, in the time that we have together in this service, that truly, Lord, we might hear from heaven, that we might be quickened, moved upon, changed, and made like unto you, Lord, becoming a functioning member of your body, hearing your voice, learning of your ways, and entering in, Lord, to that which you're about to do in the earth. And we would ask, Lord, that we here today as a corporate expression of your body, that we might have an effect on the city of Washington and through this city, Lord, on the nation. We pray for the government. Lord, we would ask an intervention of mercy that somehow, Lord, in this present war that you'll intervene and bring it to a halt quickly, Lord, in mercy. Intervene, Lord, and let them hear your voice, your desire in this, Lord. We pray for the nation, for the president, for the government. And we ask, Lord, that as we meet here month by month, that we might have an effect on this city, on the nation, and the nations of the world that are within this city and outward to each nation. Oh Lord, we don't understand, we don't need to, but Lord, we come believing that we can affect the heavens, that we can be changed. Oh, we thank you, Lord, we thank you, Lord. And in all this, Lord, very carefully, we give you the glory, acknowledging you, Lord, and asking that truly that you move upon us, that you meet us. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Many, many groups get together and say there's a need. They search their hearts and come up with a method or a means of solving it. And this has happened so many times. And I want to be careful how I say this, but I've been in meetings where this has happened. Lord, we've come up with this plan. Now we're asking, Lord, that you come and bless our plan. Remember the disciples tried that. They, after Judas had... had uh, betrayed the Lord and later he hung himself and so they met together and they said the Lord picked 12 now there's only 11 and the Lord is has ascended he's back to heaven and so it's up to us and since there were originally 12 there should be 12 and so they considered the possibilities that the 12 were came from those that had personally been with the Lord and that in order to be an apostle it should be one that would be with the Lord and they searched out and they found two possibilities. 
And so they came and they, and they prayed. They said, Lord, which of these two do you pick? <laughs> <laughs> and finally they drew, you know, they drew a lot and they picked the one of the two and we'd never heard of them after that. And basically I believe the Lord said that he didn't pick either one. And when the Apostle Paul came on the scene later through the manifestation, the Lord appeared in such visible glory, such manifest glory that he fell off his horse and he was blinded, had to have his sight restored. And Paul talked of himself as being one who was born out of due season, and Paul the Apostle. And so the disciples got together in the meeting and they picked and prayed. And the Lord said basically neither and the Apostle Paul took the place of the one that that had betrayed the Lord and I believe that the burden that I have is certainly I feel a very direct burden for Washington for being here and I don't have any program or methodology and nor do I want a program nor a methodology but I believe that I have a very specific burden and it's this that a body of believers, as we come together, that we can become more sensitive, more aware to the presence of the Lord, that we can become available to the Lord, that the Lord through us, as he chooses, can reveal and make known his purpose, and then we can follow and not lead. Brother Thorne Octor just mentioned too that went through these intense dealings of being reduced down to where they had to trust the Lord. I went through a similar experience. I had owned a television cable system and a general insurance agency, and I was doing quite well. And I was dealt with by the Lord to sell them. I received enough money from the sale to pay my way totally out of debt to go to Bible school, and I had enough money to pay my way through school and live on for six years. After I was in school a short time, I was dealt with by the Lord to give away the check when it came each week, to give it the check away, which meant we had nothing. It was not working, and soon the food was gone, had a wife and three children. We had no food. The kids came home one day and said, someone just threw a whole bunch of squash on the school dump. So we went to the school dump and gathered up all that squash, brought it home, cooked it, froze it, and day by day we were getting squash out of the freezer and eating it. Then someone mentioned that one of the teachers had a bag, a burlap bag of dried beans under his trailer. So we went and asked, could we have some? So we had some dried beans and squash. Absolutely no money of any kind. And this went on for weeks. Until finally we came to the place of absolute dependence. You see, Brother Thorne mentioned that about being reduced. And there's different ways that we can be reduced. Not all of us have to go through that, hopefully. But there's a lesson. And that lesson is exactly, give us this day our what? Yeah. Our daily bread, that we trust the Lord. In other words, what the Lord is looking for is the people that become sensitive of their dependence on Him, of their need, and then a willingness to become dependent to the extent that the Lord can then express His life through them and their life becomes the expression of his life and that's the burden that i have for such a people that we can come to that place where we can become in the earth today when john the baptist was asked who he was he did not say i am apostle so and so or i'm prophet so and so or i'm this or i'm that john said rather perhaps the most profound thing that could ever be said he said i am the voice of another that's all. I'm just the voice of another. Preparing the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. And, you know, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That meant this. And I'm not emotional. I have a very hard time giving expression or expressing. And I pray this because I'm very needy. In fact, when I see a ministry that is very outgoing and expressive and dynamic, boy, I drool. And I run up and I get them to pray for them. Say, I need some of that. And you see, because I don't have that expression, that ability. When John the Baptist said this, I'm the voice of one, what? Crying. In other words, he wasn't just like he had a tape recorder in his mouth, but rather he was giving expression 
See, he, he's crying. There was, there was uh, an expression of the life of the Lord through him. His whole being radiated that expression. And I prayed that probably more than any other phrase in the Word of God. I asked the Lord, Lord, I want to be a voice, a channel, an instrument through whom you can speak or move. Lord, I want to be that. And so that's my prayer, that I can be that expression of the Lord. The Lord desires a people. One can put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand, and that multiplies on up. So then, there is an advantage, there's a reason, and the word says this, that we're not to forsake, especially in the last days, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, because there's an authority. Now, I think we've noticed something. Here or anywhere, in any meeting, the strongest presence of the Lord is usually in the song service. Have you ever noticed that? There's a stronger manifestation of the presence of the Lord in the song service than in any other part of the service. Now, I always like to kind of, I say, why? Well, I believe I understand why. And I'll explain it to you. It's real simple. Nothing profound about it. When we're singing, the words are very simple. They glorify the Lord. They're straightforward. And basically, because they're simple, straightforward, they're mostly testimony, we're in agreement, and we totally agree. And so when we enter in, when we begin to sing or participate, there's something about music in our being that opens up our being, and we become that. And we sing it, and, and, and we're unified with that. We, we, we partake of that, not just in word, but like the voice of one crying, there's an expression. Our whole being enters in. And when we come into that unity, the Lord moves on it. On that unity, that releases the Lord. He moves and his presence is revealed. The greater the unity, the greater the manifestation of the presence of the Lord. Because we've come into a unity. Now, it, now when the word comes, we're all thinking. Do I really believe that? Do I think that? Well, you know, where are they, you know, and, you know, we all wonder and we question and see it's different. But if we come to a unity, to a common unity, as a body of believers and we get adjusted and, and as, as we begin to grow in the Lord, as that unity increases, I believe there's going to be a greater and an increasing manifestation of the Lord where we can move out and affect things individually and also as we meet together corporately in a very special and profound way. The Lord's going to move on us. Now, Psalm 86 and verse 11. Psalm 86 and verse 11. Teach me. That, that's my calling. Basically, when people say, what's your calling? I'm a teacher. That's real easy because the Word says this. God has said in the body, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The teacher's on the bottom. <laughs> so that makes it real easy for me to say. Teach me thy way. The way of the Lord relates to wisdom. The way of the Lord is not what he's doing, it's behind. See, Israel saw the deeds of God, but Moses, the ways. Israel saw what God did, but Moses understood what he was doing and why. And what he, you see, there was something deeper than just seeing what's happening. Knowledge is the fact. Wisdom is what to do with the fact. A lot of knowledge will destroy us. A little bit of wisdom will take us a long way. Amen. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Now, I will walk in thy truth. That is an affirmative statement. I will walk in thy truth. What's the next word? Unite. See, there it is. See, bring me into a unity, to a harmony. Bring my life together. Where with a single heart and a single purpose, in the totality of my being, I can worship, I can praise, I can be available to the Lord. Unite my heart to fear. The word fear there is not to be afraid, but it means to reverence in King James English, that I might reverence, respect, love your name. Unite my heart. So then, you see, teach me so that deals with the things that would separate, where I understand there's a purpose, there's a goal, there's a reason. I come into an understanding, 
And then the Lord begins to bring us into that unity. And I believe in these meetings, as we meet, there will come increasingly a unity of understanding of what we're doing, why we're here, a greater freedom to worship, to enter in, to praise, a, a more of a trust in, in the word where we can believe, where we can actively believe for the heavens to open. You see, the, the, the results that we desire are not going to come because I'm a good speaker, which I don't think I am, or because I have some great revelation, which I, I don't really have, or that I'm some great charismatic person, which I'm not. But it's, it's going to come because there's a willingness why, to look beyond to the Lord, you see, to look past all of this, where there's a unity of heart and purpose, where we can look beyond the circumstances, the arrangements, where in the worship, we, I thank the Lord for, 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 for Tony and the music, but see, but we can enter in and we can go beyond him right up into the Lord. And through the word, you can go beyond the person that's speaking into the Lord. So it isn't so much facts and information as it is that we're being released through the word. See, Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and life. Not facts and information. See, not facts and information, but spirit and life. That's the word lifted into that higher dimension through the anointing where there's the release, the greater release of the purpose of the Lord. A verse that changed my life a good many years ago, we don't need to turn to it, it's Isaiah 119. Isaiah chapter 1. And the word says this, the willing and the obedient shall eat the good of the land. That translates in, 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 in our modern day understanding to this, the, the willingly obedient you know, you can, you, can, you can demand a child to sit down. And if the child had the right ability within himself of his position at that time, he'd say, well, I'm sitting down, but on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> see, in other words, I'm only doing it under pressure, but I, my heart's not. See, unite my heart means that there is an obedience, a worship, a relationship with the Lord that comes out of the inner depth of our being where our whole being is united and become singularly interested in spiritual things in the Lord, where we're literally transformed and changed, every cell of our being. Only the anointing can do that. No program can do that. No, man, no vision from any man purpose. See, it takes the anointing, the intervention. <clears throat> in any material is made up of molecules. Which, which have a certain structure, and the structure determines the material. Soft iron has a certain molecular arrangement, and the molecules are so arranged that the, the atoms, have a, each atom has sort of a, a molecular direction, which can be labeled north and south, and, but it's random, and so they all cancel each other. But when an electrical charge, if you take soft iron and put an electrical charge, the molecules easily rearrange. It has a particular quality where the molecules rearrange all in rows and everything that's north points one way that you can label south the other. In other words, there's a magnetic pull because everything lines up and it becomes magnetic because of that, because it responds. There's other materials that would take a tremendous amount of voltage to rearrange. It's not practical, but soft iron has that quality. It takes a little bit of power. You've seen them. These cranes, they have a big, big, great big piece of metal or this round thing and, on a, and cable and they put it down, they turn on the power, it becomes magnetic, they pick something up, go over, they shut the power off and it drops. And it's, it's a sort of a magnetic lift. And so it's because there's a, a, a quality within the soft iron that it easily adjusts. Now, our being concerning spiritual things, we're sort of like that random arrangement, we're kind of neutral. But when the presence of the Lord comes, if we're sensitive, all of our being begins to realign. See, the presence of the Lord does that, and I'm aware of that. After the meeting, I always pray for people. Or if I'm in a place where there's an anointed ministry and they're praying, I get right in line. Because that anointing, when it does whatever in my being that's out of alignment, as I prayed for again and again, my whole being will begin to become more sensitive See, my whole being begins to line up 
and I become more aware, more sensitive. There comes that unity where the things line up in the spiritual dimension and I become available to the Lord because, see, I have that sensitivity, that ability that only comes through the presence of the Lord. Now, I just want to say this about the presence of the Lord. There are, there are, uh, there, there, there are demons and also theologians that would tell us. <laughs> they both tell us the same thing in this particular case. <laughs> I'm against the, the demons, but not necessarily the theologians. But this is what they're saying. In order to have the presence of the Lord, in order to have visitation, we have to repent. We have to be more spiritual than we are. We're not spiritual enough. See, demons will tell you that. As soon as you start to pray, you're not spiritual enough to have visitation. The Lord can't use you. You're not spiritual enough. You can't hear. You can't. The theologian would tell you. You're not, you're, you haven't gone through all these programs. You haven't repented and you haven't. But see, we really can't. This is what the Lord would say. I'm going to pour out my presence to bring your being into an alignment where you can discern your need, sense your need, where you can repent and you can enter in. Therefore, it's the presence of the Lord, it's visitation that brings us, that changes us. Amen. See, it's not that we're, ch that, we get, that we're changed so we can have visitation. We have visitation so we can be yes. changed. Amen. Right. And there's those that would tell us the opposite, but they have, it, they have it wrong. So we can believe, but somehow, see, we fall into disunity because we've got these voices telling us, well, the Lord can't move because we're not spiritual enough. Or the Lord can't move because so-and-so is here. And they're not spiritual. We just happen to know that. <laughs> well, that's a bad one. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's true. You know, we're all, a lot of us think that way. And sometimes the Lord amazes us because he moves in places where we never would think that he could. Back in the 1950s, I was attending church in a particular denomination. And basically, this denomination said, when visitation comes, it's going to come through us, and everyone's going to have to come to us to receive. That's what they were saying. Well, the visitation came, and it totally bypassed them. Didn't come to them. In fact, they took a stand against it. They said it wasn't the Lord, because it, they thought it was going to come through them. And it totally bypassed them, and, and, they, and they couldn't stand it because it was coming through people that they did not consider spiritual enough to be moved upon by the Lord. And it really befuddled them because they thought that, you know, they had all these requirements that they, they were all, you see. But it's not that, but rather what it is, it's, it's like a conduit, a conduit, electrical conduit. You've got to have a particular kind of conductivity or wire for the energy to flow. And while the Lord is asking is that we come to a unity of heart, of spirit, Lord, we desire you. That we can lift up our hearts and look beyond circumstances, stop looking at ourselves and limiting ourselves. We're not spiritual enough. We're looking at others, they're not spiritual. There's no way the Lord could move here because, because, because. That's the very reason he can. Because the Lord likes to show that he's mighty, that he's strong. The Lord likes challenges. <laughs> So the greater the need. You know, when the Lord wanted to convert the world, he didn't pick the nicest, most spiritual person he could find. He went out and found the one that was actively persecuting the church. Saul of Tarsus. The whole church was fearful of him. They were afraid of him. He was actively out persecuting the church. But when he got converted, he began to do the opposite. You know, there, there's a common saying, and this is true. I'll guarantee this is true. If you want to get something done, find somebody that's too busy to do it, and they will do it. If you go to somebody that's not doing anything, they will continue not doing anything, and you won't get it done. So if you want to get something done, what you do, you find somebody that's too busy to do it, and they'll do it. That's true. See, so the Lord is looking for those that are available, where we come to that unity, where we can hear his voice, and simply we're available to become that voice, that expression. And then day by day, the Lord will lead us in, and that's the word of the Lord, that day, day by day. I remember John Wright Follett, he was a spiritual father to me. He had a, a, an unusual walk with the Lord. And he said, you know, some people are trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, and, 
you know, is there going to be a rapture or isn't there, or when, and who's going to get raptured, and all these great things, and, you know, who's, the, who's this and who's that. He said, it's all I can do each day to discern what the Lord wants to do for this day and then walk with them in that. And that's the word, daily bread. See, that's, that was the word of the Lord. That, that, the, that we're available, that each day we simply say, Lord, I'm a mess. We just, all right, now that's out of the way. <laughs> now, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. I'm, I'm available, Lord. And I know I'm a challenge, but that's all right. Now, Lord, move in and through me. I'm available, Lord, for whatever you want in this day. Give direction and purpose to my life in this day. And then we walk with that sensitivity to the Lord. And it's amazing. Unite my heart. See, where we can come, where I can be lifted above all of the reasons why I can't or shouldn't. No, it's, it's interesting. When the 5,000 were, were, were to be fed, Jesus turned to the 12 and said, you feed them. You know what they did? They immediately began to explain to the Lord all the reasons why they couldn't. We don't have this, we don't have that. There's, there's only five loaves of this little fellow. There, there, there's, we have you know, enough money to buy about 12 loaves of bread, and that's not going to do it. There's a village in the, over there, and they can go over there. See, they had all the reasons why they couldn't. And the Lord simply said, you. And so, finally, the Lord broke through that and got their attention. He broke the bread, he multiplied it, and they distributed it. But see, that's all the Lord is asking. You know, if we have the ability to do something, the Lord will not ask us. He'll only ask us to do that which we are incapable of doing. Then who gets the glory? The Lord. If we can do it, then we're going to get the glory. So he's always going to ask us, unite my heart. Bring me beyond that. The willingly obedient, where I can look beyond all the reasons that would hinder or frustrate. Now, we're going to look at a verse. It's in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. This has to do with the Tower of Babel. Verse 4. And they said, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heavens. And let us make us a name. Not to see, this is a self-centered, where, where, where now they're building apart from God on their own, where the Lord is not included. They've excluded God totally. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is what? One, unity. Now this is interesting. And this they have begun to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That is the power of what? Unity. When we can come together. That's why in the worship, why there was such a presence of the Lord. Because we came to a level of unity where the Lord was released to do that. So what did the Lord do? Verse 7. Let us go down and confound their language. Where we all begin to speak our own thoughts, our own ideas. Apart from the mind of the Lord. The human mind. Confound their language. So that they may not understand. And so there's our first evidence of tongues. Speaking in tongues. Which no one understood. Of course eventually it became the languages of the world and scattered and then we have all these ethnic divisions and, and all that came out from that, from that scattering. But there was a confusion of tongues. Now, the confusion of tongues brought an end to that which they were seeking to do. Nothing will be restrained from them because they were unified. Now if we, if we bring that into a unity here, we could affect this nation, powerfully affect this nation, if we could come to that level of unity. And certainly the human is capable of it because they were that unified that the Lord had to come and scatter their language so none of them could understand each other. Now, 
We're going to move way up into Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. I indeed, the word baptize, I don't know if you know this, I, most, some of you probably do. The word baptize is a Greek word. It's not, an, it was not, it's an English word now, but it wasn't. But when the translators were, were, were doing the Bible, they had a disagreement. See, they, 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 they were translating Greek words into, into English when, for the King James translation. And they, and they had a major problem. The, the word baptize can be translated two different ways, depending on where you go to church. If you're a Lutheran, a Methodist, an Episcopalian, it means to sprinkle. If you're a Baptist, it means to immerse. So if they translated this word, this is the Greek word, he shall, if they said immerse, all the Pentecostals would have bought it and the Baptist, but the Lutherans, Episcopalians, and Methodists and others, they would not have bought it. But if it said sprinkle, then none of the full gospel people or the Baptists would have bought it. And so, so they, they couldn't decide what to do. And so someone got the brilliant idea, we won't translate it, we'll let each person, we'll put the Greek word in, and each person can translate it for themselves. <laughs> so they satisfied everyone. And that's what this is. It's, it's, it's an untranslated word because they couldn't agree if it meant sprinkle or immerse. So the true meaning, of course, is immerse. I believe scholarship can establish that. When Jesus was baptized, it said he was baptized because there was much water there, which meant he wasn't sprinkled. He was, when he came up out of the water. So I believe scripture is pretty clear. But, but tra religious traditions are very strong. And so there was a problem with this. But I baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Baptists have a real problem. I just This is extra, but I just want to put this in. The word says one baptism. The, the Baptists say we were baptized when we were saved. They said well, this, this, and they reject this, the, the Holy Spirit baptism. But, the, but actually they're right, and I'll explain it. When we're saved, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. We are made a member of the church of the body of Christ. We are immersed into the body of Christ. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But this says, he shall baptize you. He whose shoes I'm not worthy to baptize you, he shall baptize you. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the baptism of Jesus in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which, is, which confuses the Baptist about, about the, the full gospel and, and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. See, because we say baptism of, no, it's a baptism in. We are immersed into the Holy Spirit where he takes possession and moves through us to reveal Jesus in a greater measure. The baptism of the Holy Spirit means that I made a member of the body of Christ. I receive that when I'm saved, exactly what the Baptists say baptism of the Holy Spirit, but now the baptizer is the Holy Spirit, now the baptizer is Jesus, and I'm being baptized in the Holy Spirit, so he gains possession because the Holy Spirit came to reveal Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. But he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. Now, I want to go just a little further with this. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just a little further. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to reveal Jesus. So I receive through that a new tongue, and I can glorify God. He who speaks in an unknown tongue is glorifying God. So now tongues brought confusion. Now tongues are being used as, as our, our re, we are again given with a different purpose. To bring what? Unity to bring us to unity, that we're glorifying God. Now, the word says, he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Why is that? If I get a revelation in English, supposing the Lord starts to quicken me in a revelation, I'm hearing something, my head is thinking about it. I'm wondering, is that really right? 
and I'm beginning to wonder about it, and I lose the revelation. That has happened to me quite a few times. I lose it. But if I'm praying in tongues, revelation, he said, I'm glorifying God, I'm, I'm speaking mysteries, I'm receiving revelation, I'm speaking it in tongues, it's being spoken into my spirit, I'm being edified, that revelation's coming into my spirit. There's a deposit of revelation that'll come within me, then gradually it will unfold and open and I'll understand it. If it came to me in English, I'd get it all messed up with my mind. But it comes in tongues into my spirit and then it's released gradually into my understanding. So as I pray in tongues, I'm being edified. I'm receiving revelation. And I'm coming into that deeper relationship with the Lord. But there's something more here. There's fire. Adam had a covering. It was called Shekinah. It was the glory. And in transgression, he lost it. And when he lost it, he hid from the presence of God. And when the Lord said, where are you, Adam? He said, I hid because I was naked. So we see pictures of a naked man and woman hiding behind a bush. That's the mind at work. Adam did not lose clothing. He did not all at once lose his innocence and found out what it, was, what it meant to be naked. That has nothing to do with it. He did not lose clothing. Rather, the Shekinah is the covering that, that enables us to abide the presence of God. If I, we cannot stand the presence of the S-U-N. You know, we would be burned, burned up if we got anywhere near it. We can't even look at it. So when the S-O-N was, his reign was shown as the sun. When he appeared to Saul of Tarsus, Saul fell off his horse and he was blinded. It was so brilliant. And I've had this experience. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Let it, it'll rest in peace. <laughs> so, uh, the Shekinah is the covering that enables us to abide the presence of God. So as I come into a greater level of Shekinah, I can, I can come into a greater presence of the Lord. You see, the, now in 1958, 1950, let's see, 1958, I literally stepped into a pillar. I saw it with my visible, I saw it and I stepped into it. And I started to jump, a visible glory, manifest glory in a major visitation of the Lord. And I started to jump because I couldn't stand it. It got so powerful. And I reached the point where I either would have gone, at, if it, at the thickness of a hair more, I would have either gone insane, exploded or died. It got that strong, but it changed my life. And then it backed off. And so, now, I would like to believe, and I'm believing for this, for a visitation of that level again. But I believe today I should be able to go much further because either there's a greater work of the Lord, the quickenings, the revelations, the workings, the times I'm prayed for, the impartations of spirit, the, the, the release of anointing into my life when we sit under an anointed ministry. You see, all this is developing that ability to abide the presence of the Lord. And we should be able to, I should be able to abide a much greater, I should be able to go much further now than I did then because I'd have the greater, the, that, that covering would be much greater today than it was then. So when Adam hid, he hid because he lost the covering and that covering became an enemy, a flaming sword. Now I saw something. That, that, that flaming sword was to keep the way of the tree of life which pre prevented Adam from coming into the presence of the Lord. But later, later, when Moses stood before a burning bush, it burnt with fire and was not consumed. That was Shekinah. The glory, when the glory came into Solomon's temple when it was dedicated, the glory was so great the priests couldn't stand. That was Shekinah. When Jesus was transfigured, his raiment shone as the sun. That was Shekinah. Then on the day of Pentecost, there descended what? Cloven tongues of fire. That which had been an enemy now became a friend. But there's something interesting in scripture. I only saw this about a week ago and I got excited. In, in the Pentecostal visitation, I'm gonna say something else first. And down through the, the church age, all down through, 
from 1900 when the, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit began, the Pentecostal visitation, the latter rain, the charismatic visitation, we've come to tongues, gifts, ministries, healing ministries, all these prophetic ministries with powerful prophetic ministries, all these ministries which have to do with the Holy Spirit, the purpose being to glorify the Lord. If I'm anointed, I'm going to present a much clearer word than if I weren't anointed. You're, and you're going to hear it in your spirit rather than in your mind because I'm anointed. But this was the Holy Ghost and fire. The, fire, the word says this, the fire rested where? On their heads. See, it came down and sat on their heads. Then it stops, doesn't say anything more. And all at once, it occurred to me, right down until today, there is yet to come that visitation of fire, of the Shekinah. We're not there. We're in the time of the closing out of the charismatic visitation because the emphasis was on gifts, ministries, healing, all these special ministries, which are all wonderful, but we've not come to the Shekinah, which is the revelation of the Lord. But it rested upon him. Why? Because Adam chose to go his own way, and he lost it. The Lord, it, the Lord had breathed into him, and he received it, and, and, and it was his covering. But he forfeited it. Now the Lord desires, see, he gave the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, they're in one accord, the Holy Spirit came within. See, you shall be immersed in the Spirit. But the fire, it said, sat on their head. The, and the, I believe the reason we have not come to a visitation of fire is that we have to invite the Shekinah, the glory, to come where? Within. See, it rested on their head. And we have to, glory, thank you, Lord. See, we've got to ask that to come where? To come within. And that hasn't happened. And when that happens, when that glory comes, then the temple of the Lord is going to be prepared, made ready to become a habitation, a house of prayer for the, for the presence of the Lord. The Lord's going to begin to appear, begin to move. The apostolic will be restored and this world will be shaken again by the church because the fire. Now, there's a progression that will lead into that. And we have to accept the Lord, we have to believe for it. We have to acknowledge the Lord, we have to invite Him to come. And I believe that as we do that, some are afraid of the presence of the Lord. I've been in meetings where the presence of the Lord got so strong, people got up and ran. Because they were scared. It was that powerful that the people ran from the meeting. I wouldn't mind. I'd like to have that. <laughs> but I'm believing. But as we come to that level of unity, the Lord again is going to move. Now, just one more verse and then we're finished for today. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Speaks about wheels. And it has to do with the Shekinah. And I just want to see now, I want to find where it says the wheel within a wheel. Verse 21, we'll try. Well, verse 20. Well, 19. <laughs> Keep backing up. I think we can do it from verse 19. This is Ezekiel chapter 1. When the living, creature, where, when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. When the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Then there was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheel. Now this is sort of a week. Now what is that? The wheel within the wheel. We're the wheel that the Lord wants to use. And the Spirit of God wants to come, is within our lives through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But something more has to come in, the Shekinah. See, the wheel within the wheel. And this, 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 and he's talking about, notice verse four, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came and out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, that Shekinah. And this is a vision of the Shekinah being restored to the church. 
And when the Shekinah glory again comes into our lives, we'll become that wheel within the wheel. We'll become that where the Lord now can reveal himself through us, where we can be. You know, the world has a saying sometimes, so-and-so happened to be in the right place at the right time. You've heard that. Well, you know, they, well, how, how they ever do it? Well, they just have to be in the right place. Well, we're going to be in the right place at the right time because the wheel within the wheel is going to move us. Glory. Hallelujah. You see, the Lord's waiting to get that Shekinah that's sitting on our head, resting, to come within the wheel that we can function in the purpose the Lord had. Then we will become the wheels that will move the purpose of God forward. It's sort of stalled right now. It's sort of the charismatic. There's sort of a confusion. The charismatic's closing out. There's, there's some blessings, indicators. The Lord is speaking. But when that glory comes within the wheel, within the church, we're going to purify the gold. Now this gold dust. In the Laodicean church, the word to the Laodicean was this, because you say you are rich and increased in goods. In other words, their emphasis, that gospel of prosperity. It works, you know, Richard, we, we're a prosperous people. We have, you know, we're blessed. We have all kinds of things. But the Lord said, I want to do something beyond things. I want to come into your life. I want to energize you to become a witness. You're to become a witness, a power in the earth, a wheel that's going to move the purpose of the Lord in the earth. And the Lord is saying, I want to come within. Therefore, the word, I counsel thee to buy of me what? Gold, tried in what? Fire. That Shekinah, restored he whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch, he shall immerse you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. That's the Shekinah restored. It came back, but it has yet to come within. As a people, if we will begin, and I've, I've begun, I'm doing it now. I start because I just got this within the last week. All at once it dawned because I wondered, where's the fire? I have checked every movement, every visitation. I mean, all around the world, I've listened. I said, for a, 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 where there's the fire, you don't, it, it isn't. It's not. You won't hear it anywhere. You'll hear all kinds of other things, and they're all tremendous, but you'll not hear fire or Shekinah. But it's going to happen, and the Lord's going to move. Now, I'm believing the Lord, and I'm praying we're going to have it right here. We're going to have a touch of that, and the Lord's going to move. And we're going to become right here. That that wheel is going to come within. We're a wheel right here, a little this me. Now the wheel, see, not methodology or a program, but now the fire, the Shekinah is going to come within and energize, and we're going to begin to move, and the world's going to be impacted. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the Lord's going to do a mighty work, but it's going to come through the fire, that restoration of Shekinah. It's it's here, but it's got to come within it's got to, and begin to purge purify and it will bring us it'll melt out all that would divide because the lord's purpose is unity and it'll bring us into that unity restored for the purpose and the glory of god amen, amen. thank you lord hallelujah amen. okay let's all stand lord we acknowledge you, your presence, your purpose, your word. Lord, I believe you've spoken to us. This is your word. And that Shekinah, at the end of the sixth day, you went up into a mountain and you were transfigured and your raiment shone as the sun, the Shekinah. And Lord, that Shekinah, we're at the end of the sixth day. And that Shekinah now, which came upon you, as the head now is going to come upon the body, as we come into that unity and harmony so that you're joined and, and the head and body come together, and then comes within the glory and be energized, and your purpose in the earth will be released through the Shekinah restored. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, we don't understand it, and it's too great for us. But Lord, we're willing. We're hungry. We're available. And Lord, we would ask individually, each one of us individually, Lord, and then corporately we would ask, Lord, that the Shekinah will come within. Burn the dross. Purify the gold. You're speaking of gold, Lord. You're calling our attention to gold. The manifestation of gold, Lord, and 
Teeth are being filled with gold fillings, and gold flakes are appearing on people in many places. You're calling our attention to the divine nature, perfected, seeking to come within. O oh Lord, bring us that we might buy gold tried in the Shekinah. Our nature's changed by your presence, by your glory. And Lord, we ask that greater visitation in these meetings, month by month, that we might enter in. And Lord, we're available for further meetings as you would direct and lead. Whatever you would have, we ask, Lord, for working out the details as to where and when and what. But Lord, we're available and we greatly desire to meet with you, to pray, to seek your face, to enter in, to become, Lord, the people of the Spirit for your purpose and for your glory. And we ask, Lord, that we might be quick and moved on, anointed. Glory now, Lord, for each of us that are here, we impart a special blessing. Receive, be quickened, be healed, be anointed and moved upon by the presence of the Lord. And Lord, for those that are traveling, be with them as they travel. For those of us that are here, as we pray, Lord, for those that would like prayer, we ask, Lord, for that special release of your presence, of your anointing, upon each one that comes for prayer. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for we ask it, Lord, in the name that's worthy, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. Amen. If you'd like prayer, if you'd come up, we'll, we'll pray with you.